how's everybody doing tonight? Everybody feeling good? Woo! I'm Emeril Lagasse, and tonight I thought I would take you through a wonderful trip to Northern California, to Napa Valley. Beautiful place. And I'm excited because uh, we've got a very special guest in the house. Michael Green's here, who uh, is not only uh, a great columnist and contributor to Gourmet Magazine. Oh, don't, don't be too alarmed. You know, I, we thought what we would do tonight is kind of do the big four. There's a lot of confusion about the big four of Napa Valley. Uh, Zinfandel, Merlot, Cabernet. And uh, we're going we're gonna to concentrate on the big four and have some fun. We're going to do a couple of wonderful wines, and then we're going to pair them with some food and show you a little bit about food and wine pairing. I'm talking about seared salmon with a wild mushroom and white bean ragu. Yummy. Maybe a little Merlot reduction sauce. You would never believe with red wine, but barbecued rock shrimp over creamy grits is going to be one of the dish. And then we're going to kick it up a notch with some seared beef filet and a little blue cheese glissage. Is that all right with you guys? You guys all right with that? We're going to let the tasting begin right here on Emerald Live. Guys, how you doing? Welcome. Give it up right here for Michael Green, everybody. Uh, great yeah. wine, buddy. And of course, Doc Gibbs and Cliff is in the house. Yeah. Nothing like a little vino show, you know what I mean, Doc? I'm ready for it, man. We got, uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize uh, the art, the science behind uh, making, making wine. I just think you just pick a bunch of grapes and stomp on it with your feet, put it in a bottle, and bam, you got wine, you know? <laughs> but um, we were very fortunate to, uh, with some, some friends of the Food Network and Michael and I, to uh, have a little bit of varieties of grapes, of wine grapes, very different than table grapes, because wine grapes are very, very perishable. And um, I'm going to show you a little, bit of, a little bit of these wine grapes right here. I grew up with uh, having a bunch of grapevines in, uh, in the backyard with Hilda and John and in the Portuguese tradition, of course. If, we used to pick all the grapes, make the wine. Anyhow, I won't go there, but uh, <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. These right here, this is, uh, this is Concord grapes, uh, which also uh, I guess people uh, relate to of making jelly, but it, it is a wine grape right here. Um, they have a wonderful smell. This smells like a, uh, I'm going to let you just get a little taste of that. Smell that? Really, um, this is what I remember growing up on, these Concord grapes, like, right here. And um, these guys right here, this is a, a Bachet grape, another grape to make wine. See, the thing with wine grapes are, some are big, some are small, some have a lot more juice in them. Uh, a lot of the skin, uh, as we're going to talk with Michael later on, is responsible for what the wine does. This here, look at the size of these. These are muscat grapes right here. This is a, a, a Napa a Gammy grape right here. A little bit smaller, medium sized right here. We were very fortunate also, since we are in New York City, to uh, have a couple of Pennsylvania, also very popular in New York State, which is growing some beautiful wines. We'll have to do another show, Michael, just on New York wines Sounds another great. time. This is a Steuben grape, and this is a Niagara grape right here. These actually are from from Pennsylvania who's also producing. Probably one of the biggest, the two biggest grapes that people know. This guy right here, you can see how small, how just jam-packed the clusters are. This is the Pinot Noir grape right here. And this grape right here, also extremely, extremely popular, particularly in Napa Valley. That's the Cabernet Sauvignon grape. So now we got the grapes, we've got that established. We're going to, when we come back, talk about wine. A good friend, Michael Green. Give it up for Doc Gibbs and Cliff. We're going to rock out. Stick around. We'll be right back.
welcome back. That's why we got Doc Gibson Cliff, everybody. Boy, we got a wonderful show for you tonight, let me tell you. And uh, we got a wonderful guest, our good friend and wine buddy, Michael Green's in the house. Yes, indeed. We're kind of concentrating on just uh, Napa Valley, and uh, people uh, are a little confused, and that's why we're kind of doing a little bit of these every now and then, these wine shows with great people like Michael, uh, just to kind of get a little bit more educated about it. And we're concentrating on the big four. What those big four are that we're going to uh, concentrate on, not so much the producers, because there's so many producers. We would be here for weeks if we uh, had to just show all the wines. It's just amazing. But what we're focusing on, the big four, are uh, Pinot Noir. That's what these two are right here. And uh, these are a couple of producers. I want everybody to know that all of these wines, uh, which Chris Robles, our sommelier in, uh, in Delmonico in New Orleans, um, we, we tried to do this with Michael uh, being affordable. So all of these wines are around $25, around $25. Some are a little bit more, some are a little bit less. It's not like we're going totally off the page. These are two Pinots right here, McCrosty and, of course, Saintsbury. Then a very interesting, this was very, these, this wine right here, this is Merlot. And Merlot, um, several years ago, became so popular you couldn't even get Merlot for a while, or at least not in, uh, in big you know, big quantities of it. And uh, the Merlot grape is probably, uh, what, what do you think, Michael? It's probably... Well, I, I call it Cabernet Sauvignon in silk pajamas. In so <laughs> <laughs> you basically got great. a lot of tannin, like the Cabernet, but, you know, in this case, it's much softer. It's so easy to drink, really accessible. Then, of course, uh, what is becoming more and more popular today uh, is the Zinfandels. And uh, this wine is really, you can really relate this to, to California. Uh, particularly the Zinfandels right here. A couple of great producers here. And, of course, I guess the most popular wine, other than Chardonnay, which Napa also produces a lot of, but is Cabernet Sauvignon. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to try to do some dishes to sort of match and give you guys a little idea about how to go about that when you want to do that at home. But I think first what we're going to do, why don't we open the Merlot. Sure. And um, we'll give this a taste right here. And... Um, you want to go at it, too? Sure. Well, I got the easy job. <laughs> I just got a drink. The, uh, the Merlot grape, uh, as we were talking about, and as Michael referred it to, is kind of like a Cabernet Sauvignon with silk pajamas on it. It's a little softer than the Cabernet. It's not as tannin. Um, has a little bit more uh, berry tasting there. You guys got some glasses? I got yeah, some glasses. Let's see what, uh, what else we get out of this. And don't worry, folks, we're going to, uh, as we're going around here, we're going to, uh, was that, wh which one was that one? The this first was one? the Swanson Merlot. Okay. We got and, the Swanson. Uh, this is from, uh, just la labeled as Napa Valley. And this is the 97 vintage, which be just as you said, a lot of berry fruit to it. And We have that there? Okay. Yeah. And then this Give is. the guest down there. Yep. Perfect. We'll let you guys in on this too. <laughs> yeah, Surrender exactly. your glasses. And uh, we'll let Michael. Uh, kind of take us through this in a second here as we kind of go through uh, go through this here. Well, you know, at the end of the day, Emeril, you and I have spoken, at the end of the day, for most people, if it tastes good, it is good. Absolutely. But it's sort of, uh, you know, it's sort of fun to sort of take people through, at least from our perspective, what we sort of see in wine. The first thing is that you got a pretty deep color, and so most probably the wine's going to taste pretty deep. Um, I guess you I... see that, Buck? Can we get a shot of that in the glass there? We get... A little deep color, as Michael said, sort first of, of all. Go ahead, Ruby Mike. with maybe just a little bit of a browning at the rim. Mm -hmm. The nose of this wine, instead of when you stick your, stick your nose in it, um, you know, I get a lot of alcohol. It's not alcoholic. Actually, that would not necessarily be a bad thing. Right. We're right. talking about fermented grapes. <laughs> Absolutely. But, you know, it's interesting because Napa Valley is a warm place. And so you're talking about a wine here that I'm getting a lot of berry in the nose, yes, blackberry. And that's a wine well, that's Michael was referring to a little brown on the outside. If you really put it in your glass and as the color goes through... You can start to see there's a little brown ring around that, and that's, that's very common. Yeah, it's interesting, actually, because when red wines get older, slowly, that's with that sort of brown ring. Um, oh, the nose of this is great. We are not spitting this out. No. We're not <laughs> I'm not a spitter anyhow. Okay. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> I once went... Oh, yeah. I was once... I was once at a barrel tasting, 
in uh, in Burgundy. I had the fortune of a few years ago. And a barrel uh, tasting where basically you're just tasting wine before it's been before it's been before bottled. Before it's been bottled. Okay. And uh, you know we're in the caves, and I'll, I'll save you a lot of the story. But the point being is that a lot of these, as Michael will tell you, are early in the morning when you got to do this and taste the wine. And so all these guys that were with, they were like, and gals, they were like, oh, I'm spitting this out with little spit buckets. And it's 9 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, I'm not spitting nothing. I'm drinking it all. When we come back, we're going to kick it up and on. Stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Doc Gibbs and Cliff. Here's where the interesting thing, for me at least, becomes. Not having a great wine guest like Michael Green, who's a consultant to Gourmet Magazine and Great Finds in Washington, a concept. Exactly, retail wine store. Love that. And uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to move on. We started with Merlot, great tasting. We learned a little bit about that. That's the thing, you gotta just keep drinking. The more you drink, the more you learn. We love this. That's right. <laughs> now, we're gonna go to a very, very food-friendly wine, and that is, is that we're gonna go to Pinot Noir. And um, before we let Michael talk a little bit about Pinot Noir and these two that we're gonna open and taste, uh, quickly, what I'm gonna do is sort of give you an explanation of why I'm matching this dish. You would never imagine matching fish with red wine, or at least that's how people are, are, are thought and uh, get to think about it, and that's not true at all. Uh, I think Michael and I both agree that you should drink what you like, but also that there are interesting combinations that go, and this is one of them. Because we're going to do salmon. We're actually going to do a salmon dish, but I'm going to show you how simply we're going to prepare this, of uh, why it can go with red wine, or with Pinot Noir particularly. Uh, the fat of salmon, certain ingredients, and certainly the preparation of sauce, Absolutely. very important when you're matching, matching wine. And it can be as simple as olive oil, or it could be simple as, uh, you know, just a salsa, or it doesn't have to be a complicated sauce. So, now that I've confused you all, <laughs> <laughs> Michael, tell us a little bit about, I'm going to start with some shallot and shiitake mushrooms in here with a little salt and pepper, and then I'm going to let Michael start talking a little bit about Pinot Noir. Sure. It's interesting, actually. The show which we did on Burgundy, all those red Burgundies were, were Pinot Noir grape. It's a very light skin grape, and so it generally produces wines that are definitely much lighter than the other part of the big four which you're talking about, Zinfandel, Cabernet, Merlot. And it's got higher acids to it, which makes it a perfect partner with cutting through the fish oils in a salmon or preparation like this. It's, uh, it's arguably one of the greatest red grapes in the entire world. Absolutely. I'm taking these fillets of salmon. Michael, and I'm just going to do sort of a little uh, tasting piece, if you will. Can I crack some bottles? While Absolutely. Doing that? Okay, Why cool. don't you do that? <laughs> and then I've I've cooked also, folks, some white beans that we blanched off in a little bay leaf and salted water. Interesting enough, what I'm going to do to kind of throw it a little curve to Michael, and I do this with our wine guys, with Julio and Chris and Kevin and those guys. Is that what we do? Is I I got the mushroom already established, so for me. Uh, with cuisine, I'm going to go another step over, and that is, is that I've got to reduce stock. It could be a brown chicken stock, veal stock, beef stock, whatever. But you would never imagine with fish, and I'm going to add that to the mushroom and the shallot reduction with the salt and pepper. Now, the other thing is that in this pot here, I'm going to take some onion and celery, carrot, which is a classic maripois, very simple with a bay leaf. And what I'm going to do, which Michael has a lot of expertise in his wine concept, his store, I'm using an inexpensive wine to actually fortify the sauce. So I'm using this inexpensive Merlot, and I'm covering this, and I'm going to bring this up to a boil. And <laughs> as this begins to get and extract the flavor out of the maripois, 
once I get all of that flavor, which will take about 20 minutes, I strain it, and what I'm doing is I'm making sort of this wine syrup. So I'm going to let Michael now talk a little bit about that while I get ready for the salmon. I thought you were going to pour more wine in that sauce. I saw the <laughs> recipe backstage. It said a bottle, right? <laughs> All right, here we go. We'll take a whole bottle in. Emerald, you know something, though? It's interesting because the wine which you're using, that Merlot, just comes from the more general area of California. And that's one of the reasons why it's less expensive. Napa Valley, the real estate's high. The quality of the grapes arguably is a little bit better. And that's why often when people walk in a store, they'll see a $5 Merlot that might come from California. But these wines might be a little bit more expensive. That's a good point. Doesn't mean necessarily that the wine is, is really bad. Not it's at all. It's just from a different area of California. Now... I got the season, uh, the salt and pepper. Very, very simple seasoning of the salmon. And then, folks, what I'm going to do, and then we're going to pour some wine, is I'm going to take a little bit of olive oil, or a pomace olive oil, not extra virgin. I've got my sauces working right now. And now what I'm going to do is get this skillet very simply, get, start getting it hot, and then I'm going to start searing the salmon so that I can show you guys the finished dish. Now I only seasoned one side of the salmon because what I'm going to do now is I put the seasoned side down first and now what I'm going to do is season the back side so that both sides are seasoned and taste good. Keep in mind also folks, salmon cooks very very fast so you want to have all of your components that you're doing finished the mushroom, got a little bit of wine syrup that I'm going to show you that, and now I'm going to let Michael talk a little bit about the Pinot. Sure. Well, the Pinot Noir, actually, let me, let me have your glasses. Sure. This is um, a Pinot Noir from Carneros, which is a specific sort of more um, specific region in Napa Valley, and it's a little bit cooler. Thank you. And this cooler region is better suited to grapes that have thinner skins, like Pinot Noir. Uh, it's actually interesting that a lot of folks don't know that Pinot Noir is one of the great major grapes that's used to make champagne, but in this case, we don't use the skin. Um, See that? You hear that, folks? Pinot Noir grape, as Michael was saying, is a, really the popular grape that makes uh, champagne, except in that, in that method, they don't use the skin. Exactly, unless you're making a rosé. It's interesting, though, uh, you know, Emma, about the color of this wine, how different it is from the Merlot. It's much lighter. And a cool thing for folks at home to know is that generally the lighter the color of the wine, the lighter the wine is going to taste. So most probably this is going to be a slam dunk with the, with the sandwich. Absolutely. I got a few cloves of garlic chopped up that I'm going to finish in the sauce. I got some white beans. I got some white beans in there. Then I'm going to, what I'm going to now do, folks, is come back, re-season, a little salt and pepper the sauce, or our ragu, if you will. If I wanted to add a little bit more richness to this, what I could do is just add a little bit of whole butter to the sauce. But I'm not going to necessarily do that because the salmon, it's got some beautiful oil content. Nice, crispy like that. You can almost see that it's like a built-in temperature already, that the salmon, off to the side over here, if you can get that buck, is right now going uh, rare to medium rare. And then simply, to finish this dish, to go with this Pinot Noir, what I would do is I would take a little bit of the ragu of mushrooms and white beans, just on the bottom like this. I would take this beautiful piece of salmon on top of that to go with that. And then, just to accent it a little bit more, this reduction, this syrup, if you will, what I would do is just add, and what it is is a little bit of intensifies exactly what we're doing with this wine and I'm gonna let you be the judge my friend anyhow this is a tough job I, I know. occupational it's a tough hazard. job <laughs> with Pinot Noir and when uh, we come back we're gonna kick it up another notch don't touch that dial we'll be right back <laughs>
welcome back. I'm Emeril Lagasse. Tonight we're having a little food and wine tasting. You guys having a good time so far? Yeah. And our really good friend and wine buddy, Michael Green, everybody, just kicking it up a few notches. So we want to recap. We did this dish. Michael did a little bit of the uh, wine, the Pinot. You folks are, uh, how, how are you enjoying that? Terrific. Excellent. Wonderful, Fantastic. wonderful pairing, Excellent. huh? Yes. yes. You guys uh, over there, okay? Good pairing over there. Now what we're going to do, Michael and Dean and I, we're going to uh, have this other Pinot. And uh, sure. let's taste this one here. And This one's a year older. And it also comes from Carneros. Most probably it's going to be a little bit more fuller body. You know, what does that mean, Carneros? I mean, I, I, I mean, most folks, they look at a label, Michael, and they, and they, and they see that or, uh, on, on there. What does that, what does that mean? Great question. You know, when most people think of wine from California, arguably the greatest wine region is Napa Valley. Sort of like Napa Valley is Bordeaux wine. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Um, you can keep going. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Right? Um, I'm with you. But, it's interesting, actually, Napa Valley is divided into nine more specific, it's called approved viticultural areas, or AVAs. Right. So, for example, while this wine does not say that it's from Napa, it's from a more specific area in Napa. It's called Carneris, which we said earlier is great for, great for Pinot Noir. The weather and there is really important to this. Absolutely, because you cannot have a climate for Pinot Noir generally that's too warm or the grapes are just going to cook and they're going to pop open. The skins are going to pop open. That's why a cooler climate is better. And uh, it's interesting, as famous as Napa Valley is for wine, it only accounts for like 5% of all California wines. Amazing. It's a very finite area. And of course, you know, Napa Valley now, um, about 1840, is that correct? Mm -hmm. About 1840 is when they started. We're, very for a wine country, you know, we're very, very young for a wine country. 1840 were like the first grapes there. But let me tell you something. There's some unbelievable restaurants out there in Napa as well. Mind I mean, the French Laundry and Mustards uh, and... Uh, Trevino, Trevino Auberge de Soleil, Really, yeah. really wonderful, wonderful food. And um, what do you get out of... Uh, what are you getting out of this wine, particularly with this... See, for me, when I taste this and I smell this Pinot, as you guys are there, the white beans... Just a really perfectly going, going with this thing. Do you, do you guys are getting that with that with that pinot a little bit? The fattiness of the salmon, uh, really, really delicious. And you know what's also interesting is even though we're tasting through two different producers, but it's right. the same grape. Both these wines have had great acids to cut through the fish oils, and it's sort of it's a nice contrast. The richness of this of this salmon dish clearly it's a dish you can serve red wine with. Absolutely, absolutely. Now speaking about red wine. We're going to go, that's just really delicious. We're going to go to another area now. And this particular wine is gaining a lot more popularity. However, what's going on is that this is becoming now sort of the, the California wine, if you will. And there's a lot of confusion that I certainly hope that Michael and I will be able to clarify a little bit. And that is, this is Zinfandel. And the first thing that I want to say in pet peeve is that you can see is that it's not white Zinfandel. Right. <laughs> Everybody's been stuck on this white Zinfandel thing for a bit. Michael, you want to talk about that from a wine perspective? Absolutely. It was back in, I think, 1972 that a very famous prolific winery, Sutter Home, started taking the Zinfandel grapes, a very thin, a thick skin red grape, took off the skin or kept it in contact for a short time. They had a blush wine, and hence white Zinfandel was born. But it's the same grape. And the more serious wine, the great red wine that's so indigenous to California and America is Zinfandel, a red grape. And we're going to open some of those, and uh, this will really blow your mind a little bit when uh, at least... You know, Zinfandel has some spice to it. It's got some wonderful spice. But when you're kind of doing food with that from a food and wine pairing perspective, if you do spicy food, you actually kill the wine. So there's a fine line there. And uh, what I thought I would do for Michael and for you all tonight was something, again, a little crazy because it's seafood. It's red wine, but it's seafood. I'm using a very inexpensive shrimp called rock shrimp. These are rock shrimp here. And uh, Alabama, Mississippi, along the Gulf Coast, even along the East Coast, they have these. They're a lot less expensive uh, than, great for frying, by the way, uh, but they're a lot less expensive than the white or brown shrimp from, uh, from the Gulf. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little spice to that, but I'm going to kick the spice down a little bit with, by me, what I'm going to do is I've got a barbecue extraction of what I did. What do I mean by that? Well, I took sort of like a New Orleans barbecue, if you will. I took... I made a stock out of the shells, bay leaf, a lot of Liam Perrin's Worcestershire sauce, uh, hot sauce, black peppercorns, made this stock, 
And then as the stock started really getting a wonderful aroma, I strained it and then reduced it just like I did that red wine. So what I have here is this very intense, very barbecue-y sort of, but not red barbecue because there's no ketchup in here, uh, sort of uh, base or extraction, if you will. And then uh, you can begin to layer that uh, with, I'm, I'm using cream. You could use milk. You could use sour cream. You can cut some of that spice, and it's going to be interesting to see what it's going to do. So I'm going to start on this real quick by adding a little bit of oil to a hot skillet. You might have heard the, uh, a lot of times you might have heard the, uh, the, uh, the menu saying of popcorn shrimp these days. Mm -hmm. This is a lot of the shrimp that's used for that type of popcorn shrimp. I'm going to use my spice, a blend of paprika and uh, cayenne and black pepper and a little bit of thyme. I'm going to season those shrimp up. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to saute those, Michael, in this hot skillet. Really, really quick. The skillet's hot because what I'm doing... Oh, an escapee. <laughs> what I'm... Uh, what I'm... Another escapee. <laughs> I love that. Not on this show. <laughs> what I'm doing in the hot skillet, you see, is I'm really... They cook relatively quick, so I'm just starting to sort of sear them real quick to lock in a little bit of that spice and to lock in that flavor because the next thing that I'm going to do now is I add the, the barbecue extraction to this. Some of you might uh, have had this dish at Emeralds before, uh, the barbecue shrimp. It's been a dish on the menu since day one. But now I'm doing it with rock shrimp and this Zinfandel. Now, you can add as much of this or as little of this as you want. I do it strictly by color, and particularly if I'm going to uh, do this with, with Zinfandel as we're going to do right now, I kind of want to have it sort of like a, a light milk chocolatey brown. I'm going to simmer these rock shrimp. Michael and I are going to get ready to uh, kick up the Zinfandel program a little bit and taste some of that. So don't even think about touching that dial. Stick around. We'll be right back. Doc Gibbs, everybody. Oh. from uh, Nigeria. Doon Doon. Doon Doon. Or a talking drum. Exactly. And as you press, apply the pressure with your arm, it's... A, it's it squeezes the drum and... Makes the head of the head. drum. Right. Unbelievable, Doc. Yeah. Unbelievable. All right. You're just joining us. We are doing a little food and wine pairing, a little matching, talking with our good friend Michael Green, who is, uh, contributes to the Gourmet Magazine, as well as a co-founder of Grapevines, a wine concept in Washington. Check it out. And uh, delighted to have you back, Mike. Thanks for You're lot. the only guest, you know, to be back on Emerald Live. I want you to know that. <laughs> Alcohol was involved. Yeah, I'm sure that had you. something to do with it, but thanks. We are right now, Buck, if you... Um, we are talking about this right here, which is Zinfandel. Michael was telling us uh, not only about the creation and confusion about white Zinfandel, but uh, we're going to get into some of this right now. And... Um, while we're doing that, talking about it, smelling it, tasting it, talking about the California... You know, interesting enough, folks, the greatest thing Michael and I were talking about during the break, an interesting thing is that what makes Napa also so wonderful is that it's only an hour outside of San Francisco. So it really, you kind of get like a double bang for your, for your buck. It's a vacation. Absolutely. It's, an, it's a great vacation. It's really wonderful. And um, Zinfandel is what we're going to uh, taste. We're kind of covering the big four reds of California. We're into Napa right now. And as Michael was saying earlier, there are basically nine areas in Napa that uh, produce wine, areas of wine. And this is uh, one that we're going to taste right now is Zinfandel. We've you done know, Merlot, we've done Pinot. Now we're at Zinfandel. You know, Emerald, before I pour it out, it's pretty interesting. We were talking earlier about Napa Valley. Well, these wines come from, again, a more specific area of Napa Valley. The first one, the Rocking Horse, which comes from your wine list, um, is from Howell Mountain. 
great wine growing region yes. up in the mountains. And the other one comes from Mount Veeder. So it's interesting, while here really Napa Valley is not mentioned on the label, it comes from Napa Valley. Excellent. We, uh, I have done a dish to go with this Zinfandel. Uh, I'm interested to see how these guys think it's going to pair with this. Uh, I've done a sort of a New Orleans version of barbecued rock shrimp. And um, during the break, what I also did was I took some stone ground grits. <laughs> and I made some grits with this right here. A tiny bit of cheddar cheese in them, not overpowering. I love them. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting to see what's going on. Let's see how the wine's doing. Dean, what you think of that, man? Just a uh, good That's nose? Excellent. Yeah, you can see the spice just kind of creeps right out of the glass when you do that. This is what they call a blockbuster red, not for the faint of heart. We love this. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm going to give our friends over here a little taste of this. You heard what he just said, huh? Yes, so you're sir. in for another yes. treat. Okay. We're looking forward to it. <laughs> there you go. Little you. rocking horse Zinfandel. What else, Michael? What do you think? Um, actually, I thought this was great. I mean, really big, lots of flavors. And, you know, you and I have spoken about food wine pairings before, that it's not the meat, it's the lotion. And here you've got shrimp, which could be a great white wine candidate, and yet the way you prepared it, I think it's going to be really interesting with this full body. Full well, body let's ready. check it out. Let's see what we got here. One thing, folks, that you want to remember, you don't want to overcook your shrimp. And uh, what we're going to now do is this. Basically, real simple. Real gutsy, just how I think about this wine as well. A little bit of grits on the bottom, and some of the barbecue shrimp and the sauce just sort of ladled over it. Very, very, very simple. Let me get a little bit of garnish here. And um, it's going to be interesting to see how this pairs. A little bit of garnish of green onion. I'm adding a little bit more spice. And uh, you check that out. Let's do another one here. A little bit of grits. That wonderful barbecue shrimp over that. A little garnish. See what you think of that. I got you guys in the game, too. <laughs> You'll see how, uh, what these guys think of this pairing, folks. As Michael said, very, very interesting because you got this sort of New Orleans style sauce made with a lot of. Lee and Perrins in the shrimp stock, not too concentrated. And uh, the grits, which just kind of mellow it out a little bit, I think. And then this wine, it has a lot of spice. I'm getting a lot of berry, too. What do you... Uh... Absolutely. You know, you got this is a warm climate. You get a lot of crushed blackberry fruit, lots of spice, lots of intensity. And on the palate, it's got a real big, big, bold style to it. It's nice. It's really nice. And I have to say, the combination is great. It's a really, it works very, very well. Coming from you, I appreciate that, my friend. <laughs> oh, we are. <laughs> no, it's interesting, actually. Here you have the shrimp, and relatively sort of light and modest, but with the sauce and the grits, it adds such a texture to it, it can stand up to a wine like this really, really well. I, when I taste this from a food perspective also, Michael, I'm getting, I, I taste the food. I just had a little bit of the grits and the, and the rock shrimp with the sauce, which is not overly spicy for that reason that I don't want to kill the wine. But then when I taste the wine right after it, the wine just sort of explodes yeah. right in your mouth. Did you guys get that as well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, great balance like that, just unbelievable. Well, you know what, folks? We've got one more of the big four that we're gonna talk about with our good friend Michael Green, and that's this right here, Buck. We're gonna be going to Cabernet Sauvignon, and for me, when I see Cabernet Sauvignon, I get gutsy, I get big, I get tannin, I just get like, kind of like that. So for me, blue cheese, mm. I'm gonna show you something real quick that you can whop on your steak a little bit. I've got some blue cheese right here. And with that, I'm gonna add, of all things, a tiny bit of buttermilk, which has a little bit of sort of citrusy sort of flavor. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to jack it up a little bit with some hot sauce. <laughs> add a little bit more of that Lee and Perrins. Hey, and if you want to add chives, you could add chives. We'll add some chives. Want to add some fresh ground pepper.
just a little bit of salt. We'll come back to the salt thing here in a second. But what we're going to do, you can make this ahead of time. We're just going to make this little puree, this little glissage of this thing. And then when we come back, I'm going to not only show you how this goes with beef, which is a great match with Cabernet Sauvignon, but Michael and I are going to kick it up another notch. Stick around. We'll be right back. <laughs> everybody, Emeril Lagasse here. Give it up for Doc Gibbs and Cliff. <laughs> My very good friend Michael Green in the house, concentrating on the big four. Now, that blue cheese glissage, what you do is you sear. I'm using fillets, you can use ribeyes. You put it right on top after you got that beef seared like that. And then what you do is you just pop this in the oven. And then, then it's, what it's going to happen is going to begin to start melting and getting all goozy like that. <laughs> now, Cabernet Sauvignon, we have two of them here, and um, we're going to open those. Doug, thanks. And um, we got a Honig Cellars and uh, Montalina, both uh, pretty popular. Very, very popular. You know, it's actually pretty interesting, though, about the Chateau Montalena, which is one of the most collectible Cabernets. The one which actually uh, you're showing today is the second label, and it's a great trend for consumers to, to know that if you, don't, if you don't want to spend the money on a more expensive wine, they'll make a second label, which is generally a little bit lighter in style and often better to drink for tonight, so it'll be great to taste that. That's just called their Calistoga Cuvée. Wonderful. And is, does that mean it's, it's not coming from Calistoga, though? Uh, in this case, actually, they're still labeling it as Napa Valley, and okay. since you know, Calistoga is part of it, in this case, I bet it comes from all different areas of, um, of Napa, but I bet the grapes might be a little bit younger, maybe the wine doesn't spend as much time in oak, so generally have a wine that, well, is under $25. I'm ready. Uh, <laughs> he's ready. I'm ready. <laughs> yeah, the heck with the facts. Just no, shut up and drink. No, no, go ahead. I'm, <laughs> um, and, I... uh, you know, it's interesting because the other wine from Chateau Montalena, uh, you know, could be two or three times the price. Look at the color of this Look at wine. This. It's just See it's the color wine. of that, folks, right there? How just vibrant red. Wow. And, you know, it's interesting the progression you, you've, you've led everyone on. Started with a lighter grape, uh, the Pinot Noir, then the Merlot, then the Zinfandel, and Cabernet. This is, uh, this is the big daddy. What I've done is I've cooked some bacon, crispy. Then I added some onion. Because why you want to do that is the onion will not cook if you start at first because of the water content in it. So you want to start with the bacon. The bacon got crispy, then I added the onion, and then some little French beans. And what I'm going to do for these guys is I'm going to do a little bed of that in the bottom. And how quickly the glissage happens with the fillets. Now, I got these fillets tied up a little bit, so there's a little string. You see how beautiful that looks, folks? And with, in this case, with this wine, Michael, I'm doing no sauce. I'm just relying on this little glissage of blue cheese with the beans like that. Now, there is a little string, so you guys be careful. Doug, thank you very much. How's the other one? You know, it's interesting. I poured out another one, again, to give you an example of another Cabernet from Napa Valley, Honig. It's a little older. And uh, interesting from a comparison. Big. Big. You, you think this one's a little I bit I want to thank Michael Green, our great wine guest. I want to thank all of you, Doc Gibbs. Thanks for joining me tonight. I'm Emeril Lagasse. See you tomorrow, everybody.